and welcome to CB8 Speaks. My name is Benjamin Kalis, a public member of Community Board 8 Manhattan and your host. Manhattan Community District 8 extends from 59th Street on the south to 96th Street on the north, from 5th Avenue, the west, to the East River and Roosevelt Island. You can learn more about Community Board 8 on its website at www.cv8m.com. You can also learn more about joining your local community board by visiting Manhattan Borough President Scott Stringer's website at www.mbpo.org. Tonight we're joined by Cas Spagnoletti and Nick Viest, who are co-chairs of the Street Life Committee of Community Board 8. Uh, would you guys mind introducing yourselves and telling the uh, audience a little bit about yourselves? Well, my name is Carl Spagnoletti. I've lived in the area since uh, 1980 when I first came to the States. Um, I joined the Community Board Aid in 2000 after doing some work at uh, our son's um, high school. So then it was a matter of continuing on. So I joined Community Board Aid and have been there ever since and glad to be there. Well, thank you for your service. And Nick? I've uh, been uh, living on the east side of Manhattan for 20 years. I've uh, been a member of Community Board 8 since 2000. Um, so it's, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I, I enjoy uh, doing the work. We, we actually get to, uh, to help people with some things. So uh, you know, I'm glad that we can be here tonight and talk a little bit about what our, what our committee does uh, in the community. Well, thank both of you for uh, coming on the show tonight. Uh, both of you are co-chairs of the Street Life Committee. Can you tell us a little bit about the committee and uh, what it handles? Well, what we deal is mostly um, cafe licenses, uh, cafe, outdoor cafes, um, liquor licenses, uh, changes, um, anything to do with street life. And lately we have been uh, getting some new stand items on the, um, on the agenda. Um, but really that's Nick? Right, it's, it's really the, the way to understand it is that it's the sort of beginning process point of, of a, if an establishment, say a restaurant, wants to get a liquor license, they start with the community board. That's the first point of approval. We don't have power per se to stop a license from going through. This a, a eventually goes to the state liquor authority who has the power to grant the license. But w our role is one of, of being an advisory group uh, where we can have comment. And we do have influence with uh, the state liquor authority, for instance, in a, with, a li with a liquor license, or in the case of a cafe permit, uh, it's with the, the Department uh, of Consumer Affairs. The, the city uh, will grant a, a permit for a cafe. So they do listen to us uh, from time to time. Not always, but often they will. Uh, and they, they take into mm -hmm. account what we say. Um, but that, that's where the process starts. If you're an establishment and you want to get a permit or a, ca or, a or a license, that's where you have to start. Okay, and now the establishments can go online to uh, cb8m.com slash forms where they can download the application form. It's a one-page document that they need to fill out when they're coming before the community board. Uh, could you guys uh, talk about some of the information that the community board gathers and uh, how you use it in your community? Well, we came up with this form, the, the Street Life Committee, because what we get from DCA and SLA is just the application itself. So we DCA's Department of Consumer Department Affairs. Department of Consumer Affairs and SLA's um, State Liquor Authority. We decided to come up with this form in the committee, basically so we can look at this one page and looking at it, we can see the hours, the approximate food to um, liquor, uh, anything that we need to know in a one page rather than flipping through the whole application from both, um, from both agencies. Um, over the years, we used to have one form, but now we split it up, one for the cafes and one for the liquors, because they're kind of a bit different. But generally, it's the hours of service and the food to ratio, the number of people, um, any, any other establishments that they've got in the area that we can check, or they, you know, the, the people uh, know them. And basically, just information that we can glance at Right. It, it, it's a, the, the idea is really to give us a snapshot of what kind of business it's going to be. The, we're not in the business of telling someone what kind of a place they should open up. 
but we we are concerned uh, we do believe we have an interest for instance if you have a proliferation of, of bars in one area it, it, it's in the community's interest to take a look and see does it make sense you know to have uh, additional bars where you're already getting a lot of noise problems now we don't necessarily have the power to stop someone from coming into an area but it may be on a on a, on a side street where uh... there's a sensitivity of having a, a a bar that's a late night bar where where we would comment and say look this may not be something that will be supported and then we we take a vote on it but these forms give us a look at what kind of a business is going to be. Mm -hmm. So for instance, it says food drink and that refers to the the food but and the total amount of drink including its alcohol but also including non-alcoholic beverages. So for example, a restaurant that opens up is normally going to be about 80-20 food to drink. So we see that right away, we know what kind of a place it's going to be. If it says 50-50 or 40-60 uh food to food to drink and there's a greater weighting of drink than food, then we know this is going to be more of a bar. The other thing we look at is, say, the hours. The hours will tell you what kind of a place it's going to be. A bar is going to be 4 a.m. almost all the time, because that's when they're legally allowed to sell. That's really, I mean, that's how they're going to be able to make money. A, a restaurant is making money on the food as well. They're going to be open maybe till uh, anywhere between 11 and 1 a.m. Normally, they're not open much later than that. There, there are exceptions to that. But that's the general, those are things right away we can see what kind of a, an establishment it's going to be just by seeing those, a couple of those facts. Th thank you very much. And uh, are there any other pieces of information that people who go to the meetings can learn from these forums, like whether or not uh, the sidewalk cafe will close early or how late it's expected to go? Uh, are the restaurants really held to any standard in terms of how they answer these questions? and uh, in terms of bicycle deliveries, that kind of thing? Well, these forms are strictly our forms. Uh, these do not go anywhere. But we would also get the forms from the State Liquor Authority and the hours they put on there, that is what the State Liquor Authority looks at. If, you know, if they put that they're going to close at 4 a.m., we can always ask them if they wouldn't mind closing in a bit earlier, if they're going to be a bar. We don't want them closing at four. If they put that they're going to close at two o'clock on the State Liquor Authority form, that's the hours that the, they will close. Um, as far as delivery, the bikes, um, there's trouble everywhere with the bikes. They're not uh, licensed. They're riding on the sidewalks. Um, but we have noticed lately that the 19th is doing quite a good job of basically stopping them, ticketing them, and um, basically making it safer for the pedestrians. Yeah, I think the information that the public is looking for on a form like this, we put it in here really to, to, just again to get us. an idea of what they're going to be. The hours are, are stated here. But as Kaz said, and when it comes to a liquor license, what's enforceable is what's on their state liquor authority application. And we can hold them to that. So mm -hmm. well, one of the things we do, uh, we'll check to make sure that the hours that they have here uh, line up and line up with what the uh, a actual um, application says to the, to the state liquor authority. As long as we have that, as long as they're in sync, then we're okay with that, as long as you know, we, we're okay with, with those hours. Yeah. And normally we, normally we are. But, uh, for example, if someone, someone can come from the public and they may live above the place and may, they may say, look, I, I don't want a place that's open until 4 a.m., and we'll hear that out. That's part of the hearing. And that's really, I think, is what probably the primary, one of the primary functions that we have is it gives people the ability to go in and say, look, I, I, I'm not thrilled about having a place that's going to be open until 4. It's on a side street. I work at night. Uh, can you help us here? So then we get into, can get into a negotiation or discussion with the establishment to say, look, maybe it, either you can shut down a little earlier, there are things you can do to, to ameliorate some of these issues, or maybe it makes sense for you not even to open up on this location, maybe you should look at somewhere on the avenue or something like that. Now, in terms of locations, uh, is there really a difference between uh, sidewalk cafes on the avenue versus side streets on having it on 77th Street versus on 74th Street? And uh, is there a difference in terms of location about whether or not I can uh, open up a bar across the street from a church or, or uh, another bar? 
Uh, cafes are different. There's normally some of the side streets in our area that they're off limits. Uh, Ambulance Street, 70, 79th Street, there's no cafes. Um, most side streets, there's no cafes. They're not just not wide enough. Lexington Avenue is also reasonably off limits. The last time, several years ago, we had Madison Avenue, which is really small tables, just one table, no more, um, which is the small cafe um, um, that they're allowed. But mostly it's on the avenues, not on the streets. And as far as the church, there's legal limits that the bar has to be certain distance from the church or school. And that's very enforceable by the state liquor authority. Right, that's called a 200-foot rule. 200 it has yeah. to be more than 200 feet from the from the church or the school. Right. Um, although the, there are times when there are different rules that even apply to that, and ultimately mm. it's the state liquor authority's call, uh, you know, regarding that situation. There's also what's called a 500-foot rule, which means that you can't have three or more. Uh, you can have, if you have three or more establishments with a liquor license, then you need to have a separate hearing uh, to, to, uh, that applies to that license. So if I, if I go into a block where there are three other establishments, they have liquor licenses within 500 feet of my establishment, the state liquor authority has a separate hearing that the public can go to, that we can go to, uh, to testify as to whether it's appropriate. The, the, the intent of that law was you know, to, to prevent uh, having sort of uh, you know, too many establishments with liquor licenses in, in one area. That, that re it really hasn't worked out that way, mm -hmm. but uh, the, the, that's the basic idea behind what the, what the law does is so right. that there's a separate review process for that. And, and while we're speaking about the uh, streets and avenues where we can mm -hmm. put sidewalk cafes, what has been the effect of the 2nd uh, Avenue subway construction on the community on liquor licenses and sidewalk cafes? It's really been a disaster to a certain extent. Liquor license, there's no real uh, effect because mostly it's inside. It's the sidewalk cafes that have been really, some areas have been really, uh, it's been a, you know, really bad for them. Several years ago, the MTA basically suspended the outdoor cafes of some of the uh, establishments. So then when they were allowed to have cafes again, they had to jump through hoops. It's just like starting afresh. Over the past year or so, what they have is kind of suspended it for the six months, 12 months, the time that they need the area. Then they basically get the license back without reapplying and everything else. But as far as the Second Avenue and the sidewalk cafes, it's... Um, it's been a mess. It, it's a mess, and, and in some, in a lot of cases, uh, there's just not enough room right. on the sidewalk. You, the, the rule is that you need to have eight feet of clearance from the property, uh, from the cafe border to the curb. If you don't have that, you can't have a cafe. And 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 because the subway uh, construction is taking up a large part of the curb, the the, the establishment has can't have a cafe. So they're severely impacted there, but it also affects their liquor license in the sense that they have an establishment, they pay for that license, mm -hmm. and now their business might be cut in half or into, into uh, three quarters of the business that they had, and it's they made certain economic assumptions prior to the uh, to the decision to have the construction. So it's I would say in some cases for a number of establishments it's been a devastating situation for them, and and, and there are uh, the the different local elected officials are are working on solutions, but it's a very tough problem. If you have tremendous construction in front of your restaurant, mm -hmm. a lot of times people just won't go inside. They're just, for whatever reason, it doesn't look appealing to them. They're not going to go into the establishment. So it's been difficult. We had, uh, and Kaz mentioned the, the cafe issue, we've had some big establishments with who have big cafes in front. They just moved out moved uh, and, and uh, they're not coming back. So that, that's, those are serious issues, and uh, the, the Second Avenue subway has come at a price uh, for, you know, in, in our community. Um, but uh, as I said, a number of establishments really have, have suffered uh, having, it, having the construction there. Well, one thing I, I can share and uh, share with the audience is that there's the uh, Shop Second Avenue campaign, mm -hmm. and one of the best things you can do to help the businesses struggling on Second Avenue is to shop there. Bring your dollars there. If you're going to go to dinner, why not go to dinner at a place on uh, 
Second Avenue, and uh, there's a whole campaign. You can go on the web and uh, learn about them, or you can just take a stroll by the construction and uh, stop into one of the businesses because they're all pretty great. Right. And also MTA is coming out with a Metro card on the back, Shop Second Avenue, trying to promote business for the Second Avenue. So they are helping. And there, there are plans out there, and, and, uh, and, and it's important. Uh, it, whatever people can do, if, if uh, you're watching this and you live in the, the vicinity of Second Avenue, pl please try to mm -hmm. come in and help a lot of those establishments uh, that are on Second. They, they, they need the business. Fair enough. So we're kind of speaking about how Community Board 8 can help and of course talking about the 2nd Avenue subway mm -hmm. uh, shopping campaign is one way. Uh, what can you do if you've got a uh, cafe in your backyard or, or uh, any of the other problems? Which uh, We're just going to try to go through some of them like cafes in your backyard and then next we'll talk about dealing with your bad neighbor bar and uh, dealing with uh, the uh, bad bike delivery people. So we'll take them one at a time so if we can start with cafes in your backyard well we as a community board do not like cafes in the backyard if on the side street or on the street it's fine they close by 12 o'clock on a on a weeknight and one on a weekend but in the backyard it's basically the donut effect. You've got the sound vibrating up and really resonating up. So we normally try and disallow cafes with a backyard. Um, as far as the street, we're fine with it, but the backyard, we kind of unwritten. Yeah, I, I would say that it's not a rule against it. We, right. don't, have a, we don't have a rule. I, I think what Cause is saying is, the way I understand it, is mm. that in, in the past we voted, tended to vote against backyard cafes because they become intrusive to the mm -hmm. people who live, live right around right that and and they tend to be in areas where you have the, what's what cause called this donut where this, this the sound emanates from the cafe and affects a large number of people who live around it it's not to say we won't approve a backyard mm -hmm. in cases certainly where it's grandfathered right um, or or there there are some circumstances where we have approved it where it's been appropriate but we are very cautious when we approach uh, a backyard cafe because of that sensitivity. Um, and uh, it, it's an obvious advantage for an establishment to have it. They like to have the outdoor seating, but it's, it's also on the backs of the people who live uh, right, right there and have to deal with the, the, the noise at night. And so that's, that's where, it gets, uh, where it gets tough. And mm. as Kaz said, you know, we, we, tend to be, uh, we tend to look at that with more scrutiny. Uh, when someone comes in and right. wants to do that. So the answer is, you're asking the question really, what does someone do? They should, first of all, th there's not a separate cafe uh, uh, application for a backyard cafe. It's related to the, license, the liquor license, which includes the square footage of that cafe. So if you see a posting um, and you're aware that that establishment has a backyard cafe, uh, if you see a posting for a liquor license application, mm -hmm. they should come out then you can voice your concerns. And normally it's, we get, we get turnout mm -hmm. when there's a backyard cafe. The neighbors know about it because mm -hmm. they know there's a cafe there or, or backyard open area. They come out and they voice their concerns. And then we can, we can sort of sit down with the applicant and say, look, maybe it's not in your best interest to have this if there's a lot of opposition. There are cases where people have come in and said, look, it actually works well and the way they're doing it is is responsible and they can limit the sound in the hours of this cafe. We had one on First Avenue and 84th Street, which, which actually uh, worked out okay. Mm -hmm. So there are ones that work okay, but in a lot of cases, especially with a bar, it's a, it, it can be a problem. But people should come out to the meeting if they see a posting uh, and they're aware that there's a backyard space in, with that establishment, they should come to the meeting and voice their concerns or at least send emails about what their concerns are. Well, it's definitely good to hear that if you're a, a good neighbor and you mm -hmm. uh, run your backyard uh, cafe responsibly that you've had a lot of experience with the community coming out in support mm -hmm. of that application. So that, that is definitely good news all around. In terms of dealing with the bad neighbor bars where they're smoking outside and it's wafting up into your window or they're really loud or uh, they, they have a habit of hurting your personal property, whether it's your car, your bike outside, uh, what can people do? I guess the main thing what we try and tell people is call 311 with a complaint, get the complaint number, but also call the board office. 
Um, we hear renewals every two years. If it's a liquor renewal, we normally don't hear it unless there's been complaints for that establishment. If there's complaints, we will have the establishment come before us and basically try and work out with the community, with the establishment, to be kind of a good neighbour. Um, it's th We've had a few trouble bars in the area and they've come to the meeting and we've had the community there, we've had the establishment there and we kind of try and work things out between them. We're the people that they go to, we're the in-between people trying to get the two to compromise somewhere along the line. We've had some good successes, a couple of them not so good. but. Yeah, I, I think the the thing to, to point out is that um, the, the the real problem, the, the the biggest, the toughest problem is noise. Mm. The smoking issue is a difficult one yep. because te a, a bar can have people smoking outside, and really there's not a lot they can do legally to stop that. They can ask people to move over into another area, but that may that smoke will end up going into someone Somebody else's else apartment. When the law, the smoking laws changed, it forced people out onto the sidewalk. It was unfortunately. Uh, a negative aspect of the smoking law, and there, and there are obviously health benefits to having it in, inside and preventing people from smoking inside. But on, on, on the downside of that, the, the one downside we've seen is that people congregate outside and they smoke. The smoke goes up into people's apartment, but they also stand outside and talk. And sometimes when you've been drinking, you're not always that concerned about the people who are, are living around you, and you tend to raise your voice and so on. This is the way bars are. So, so we've gotten a lot of those types of complaints. Now, the, the, the establishments that we would say are problem, establish, uh, problem establishments are ones that don't do anything to try to help the situation. So they, they may just let this go on and let these people sort of do whatever they want to do and not even mm -hmm. try to say to, to, to have someone in there who works for them to go out and talk to them and say, look, keep your voices down. There's people who live here. They, they could put up a sign. Dif there are different things they can do to try to keep that problem to a minimum. Um, and generally what we find is that the places that, that don't run as, as good an establishment and are not as concerned about their neighbors, th that's where we see most of those kinds of problems. And they tend being, to be noise problems and late night noise problems. That's really where you run into it. Um, so you know th those are the those are the things that uh, we get involved with. As Kaz said, call three one one. Three one people get frustrated with three one one because they say I call three one one and nothing happened. The police didn't come. It it didn't solve my problem. But it always it always establishes a record. Once we see that there's a record of 311 calls, then we can start to take action. We can go to the authorities and start to say, look, th there's problems here. Look at all the 311 calls that we're getting. So the 311 tool can be a very powerful tool within that framework. It just it may not produce results immediately. And, and, and so you shouldn't have expectations that every problem mm -hmm. will get solved when you call 311. But if you don't call 311, we have nothing to go on except personal testimony and, 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 and submitting that to the, the various authorities isn't as effective as having a long 311 call report that we can send in and say, look, really you have to deal with this situation. We have 20 311 calls in the span of two weeks. So that's really important. What Kaz mm. is saying is, is to call 311, even though you're, you're probably very unhappy and you're frustrated with the problem, probably it right. helps us go to the authorities, go to the police, go to the state liquor authority, go to the city agencies, and, and try to get some action. Also, you can do it online, which is a lot easier than calling and hanging on for a while, too. So, And, and okay. also that becomes part of public record. Right. And so, so you have, now you have a case. Now mm -hmm. you have a, a public file that's part of that record. Whenever it's reviewed by the liquor authority or at a hearing, it's part of that record. So that, that's why it's important to do that. Okay. And the committee also deals a little bit with the bicycle issue that we were having on the Upper East Side. So we've got mm -hmm. bikes on sidewalks, we have them sliding menus under the doors, we have people chaining bikes to trees, and then we also have the unfortunate circumstance of accidents. Uh, what is your committee doing to work on those issues? Well, as far as delivery, what we try and do is make sure that they obey the law and the bikes are um, with lights, bells and everything else. We, several years ago, we did ask uh, the applicant to bring in what the delivery person was going to wear. 
although that's fallen a bit by the wayside. But we do ask them to email in a photo of the bike, the person delivering with a name, the helmet, you know, make sure that they are legal. The other problem that we're starting to have is electric bikes. And these things are very quiet, very silent, and very fast, and they come up behind you, and if you don't hear them, you don't know them, and we've had quite a few accidents, of, not many, but it's starting to increase more and more. As far as the, the police, they are trying to basically enforce the law with the delivery bikes. Um, there are also st um, state laws that we're trying to get on the books to basically license the bike, but that's a very controversial. Some people like it, some people don't. Um, but we're trying. It's, um, we're always you know, trying to get the applicant to abide by the, um, by the rules and make sure that the guys ride on the street, not the sidewalk. Yeah, okay. one, uh, one of the things on the form is that uh, that's, that's clearly right. stated on the form. So we do every, any time we see that checked off that there will be bicycle deliveries, mm -hmm. then we sit, we ask them, uh, you, you intend to have deliveries, how many bikes do you have, where do you put them? Um, if we get uh, if we get photographic evidence sometimes, or members of the community board will come in and say this establishment's bikes are chained to the trees, we bring it up with them, and we say you got to stop it. Um, and and there are cases where we have voted against someone, but but that's fairly rare. Most of the time, they get an admonition from us where we say, look, we're going to vote on this in a week. The full board will vote on this in a week. It's important to understand that Kaz and I are co-chairs mm -hmm. of a committee. That committee makes a recommendation to the entire community board. What the community board votes on then goes to this, the various agencies. That is the voice of the community board. So our committee is not the voice. Right. We're a recommendation to that entire board. Um, but the point is what, what happens is that we will say to that applicant, next week uh, there's going to be a vote by the full board. If you don't clear this up by that point, then uh, we may have to ask the board to vote against you. So those, that's some kind of leverage that we have when they're, when they're being egregious, you know, chaining up bikes to trees and things like that, or just to come completely sort of abusing uh, the rules. Um, but but it is the other issue on electric bikes. I think it's important to note is that we do need help from the state on this, mm -hmm. from the state legislators who are making laws on this. And apparently they they there's a bill. I don't know if this law has passed yet, but they want to classify electric bikes uh, under the same rules as regular bikes. And we're asking to take another look at this and see if they can c come up with some other classifications because we do see that these are separate types of issues. Well, also, this that. is where we need the public to let us know with a 311 call and call the board office. If we know that the establishment is not obeying the law, then we have something to take them up on basically when they come up for renewal that we've got, okay, you're not riding on the bike, you've got your guys uh, not with the helmets, with uh, no lights and everything, at least we have a record. As we keep saying, if we have a record, we can always go to the establishment. I want to thank both of you for uh, coming on the show and for spending so much time with us. I want to thank the audience members for uh, watching our show. And uh, you can learn more about Street Life Committee. You can follow up on meetings at CB8M.com. And you can also call the community board office at 212-758-4340. Thank you and have a great evening. Thank you. Thanks.